Thanks. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Arthur. Um, I'm a user experience researcher in the Perceptual Gruden Computing Group at Intel. Um, Megana is a developer evangelist in the software team. Um, we're going to talk about uh, developing augmented reality with the SDK and the new R200 camera. So um, to start with, I'll give a quick overview of this the new camera. Um, and we'll talk about tablet use cases in particular for augmented reality. Um, I'll give a few sort of highlights, early lessons we've learned from user studies with this kind of app. Uh, then I'll swap to Megana, who will talk about um, the SDK and some of the code samples. So um, the R200 camera, it's a, it's a new longer range depth camera from the RealSense project. Um, there's a small developer module package that looks like this, uh, plugged in USB 3.0. Um, this is an active stereo camera. Um, there's an RGB camera as well as two IR cameras and an infrared projector. Um, there's a peripheral version for developers. Um, and Intel is also working with OEM partners to integrate this into tablets, into the, the back. So the photo here you can see is um, the kind of world facing configuration. Um, more specifically, um, it sees from about half a meter to about three and a half meters, uh, depending on the, the modes and the environment. Um, and uh, with the, the RealSense SDK, there's a number of modules in there to implement different features. So the main one we'll talk about that's relevant for AR is the scene perception module. Um, it basically enables scene aware augmented reality, uh, implements camera tracking, relocalization, as well as mesh reconstruction. Um, there's other modules in the, the SDK package uh, for 3D capture, um, depth enhanced photo and video effects, uh, measurement, face detection, and speech. Um, so um, the use cases for this kind of, the peripheral can be used in you know, different environments, but mostly today we'll talk about this tablet mobile augmented reality um, scenario. And these are familiar to most of you probably. Uh, gaming and play scenarios where you're integrating digital and physical content. Um, education and training scenarios with uh, content overlaid and registered for instruction and education onto the real environment. And visualization use cases like the furniture use case of uh, visualizing virtual furniture in your real environment uh, in a registered way. So um, next I want to show a couple quick videos just to give an idea of some of the styles of experiences you can implement uh, with the camera. Um, this first one um, is the toys game, uh, which you may have seen earlier at Shahar's talk. Um, and this is basically showing uh, real-time scene perception happening to do collision and occlusion between virtual objects. You're, there's a car here you're navigating around and the real things in the scene. Um, and this will be running in the Intel booth. You can try it out tomorrow. Um, so. So um, the key points with that are it's, there's no pre-scanning involved. This is in real time. It's capturing the depth of all the, the things in the scene to do this occlusion. Um, another style of game, um, this is a proof of concept that kind of illustrates more of that capture and play kind of scenario um, where the setup here is uh, games where people are given a task to kind of build up a scene in this case with a, a few blocks and books and things on the table, um, then scan it and then it gets transformed into something different. In this case, it's like little islands. So um, this illustrates, this is kind of a proof of concept demo just to illustrate for as a developer tool. Uh, this is running in the Unreal Engine um, to illustrate procedural shading and procedural set dressing kind of effects. And this is running in a, a debug mode, so it's a little slower than, than typical. But you can see here, this, this is the scanning phase, then we get just the raw mesh, um, and then we go to 
a procedural shading that's using height information to kind of classify different types of materials and place assets differently. So this is sort of slowed down to show over time, um, scanning the scene and putting trees in interesting places. And there's a statue on the top of Grumpy Cat here. Um, so you can imagine this as part of a game where you could, um, your task is to build up a certain island, a certain path, and so on. So um, I'm going to talk about a few um, lessons that we've learned from user studies with this type of app. And uh, Intel is really going for um, some, some real usable apps for mass market appeal um, that will ship with these tablets and be available in the app stores. Um, one of the um, first things we learned, like all of us are kind of very familiar with this magic window experience where you can move a tablet or um, HMD or phone around and see a rendered view from a different perspective. This is really foreign to regular people. Um, and so they don't move, they, they don't quite get the idea. So if you show this sort of experience to regular people in a realistic kind of environment, they'll kind of just point it forward and, and they won't quite notice unless you give them instructions. So um, that's an important part of the design is doing that in a, in a, in a way that's um, effective. Um, and the reason for that is generally people are used to tablets and mobile phones as a fixed screen device, kind of a virtual environment that's fixed. Um, you can address that with um, feedback, feed forward, um, different types of instruction and tutorial. Um, you can explicitly show kind of in the scene, you know, move around this object if you're gonna scan it, or on the screen, move left and right to kind of see different things. You can implicitly kind of include this in the experience. Um, and this is a good example from uh, Google Spotlight Stories, the windy day um, experience where this red hat flies around the environment and it kind of prompts the user um, in an intuitive way to, to move their device and it sort of gets them into this experience of the magic window without having to you know, really clobber them over the head with it. So those are a couple ways to get uh, people into this idea of magic window experience. Um, at the same time, since we're going for apps that we want people to play for more than a few seconds, um, we need to deal with fatigue. Um, so a big issue with especially tablets, but even phones, um, holding them up to view a scene for a long time is really tiring for most people, especially if you're talking about games for kids. Um, so what we recommend for a lot of these applications is to support both what we're calling an active camera mode, which is the live AR tracking, and an inactive camera mode, which is more the traditional computer graphics where you um, detach the camera from the tracking and give you a fixed, uh, either user controlled view or fixed. Um, a first reason for that is, is fatigue, as I said, um, it's less tiring. Um, but also um, there's a few other reasons. Um, touching the screen while you're holding up a tablet um, is, tricky to do precisely, and especially small hands, Peop kids have trouble reaching in to the screen. So um, you, you're kind of limited to touch zones around the edge for big like on off scan record buttons. Um, if you want to do more precise interaction like really moving things around, and especially at any length of time, um, it's much easier to do if the person can relax the tablet. Um, and so this is uh, something where Transitioning between these modes um, gives the user the opportunity to do those things. So an example where this could be used is the furniture visualization kind of app, um, kind of like the IKEA AR app from their catalog a couple years ago, um, where um, you kind of only need to see once it up in the, in, in the live view, but um, switching to a captured mode where now your room is in the background and now you can precisely move things around uh, kind of extends the experience, particularly if you're really doing a room planning kind of thing where you don't just want to see this one IKEA chair in a certain spot, you want to place a few things around the room. That's really tough to do while you're simultaneously holding up a screen. Um, um, in the gaming space, this leads to a couple different types of experience that we're exploring. There's kind of the traditional augmented, you know, real scene and this, the cars, the toys examples like this. Um, and then the more capture and play scenarios. So in these um, 
A typical way to do it is each kind of level in the game has both a, an active scanning phase and then an inactive play phase. So you can have more casual play in between these first. That, um, um, so along those lines, um, there's some technical considerations, but also just you know, ergonomic and other um, usability considerations for planning for the scene. So um, some apps, a lot of games are kind of tabletop scale, you know, one meter cubed kind of space. Um, you need to set voxel resolution appropriately. Some of the things that are more room scale mm -hmm. are a little different. And um, there you've got different settings, but also need to consider both the field of view and how big a space it'll work in. Um, in games in particular, um, you need to think about uh, what you expect users to have on hand. So we're talking about games where there's really arbitrary kind of geometry. Uh, people can have different things to build up terrain, blocks, or objects. Um, so your app needs to think about what, what people need to have on hand. And of course, you need to test this out and uh, give good instructions to users. Um, this makes uh, the level design kind of aspect of games quite a bit more abstract. There's more unknowns. Uh, the users have a lot more power about whether the game flows well or not through different levels. Um, <coughs> it's also an opportunity in that you can, um, you know, it's a more creative thing for users. Um, so you can, as I showed in the, the little video, transform objects beyond just, you know, scanning the mesh. Um, you can go to another level of Here's a procedural shaders where it's taking height to identify grass <laughs> or water, and then it's placing assets in an intelligent way based on the geometry. And you can go another step or two further into object recognition, like certain shapes, like a, uh, a box will turn into a certain type of tower and so on, um, to really um, you know, go beyond simple blending of real and virtual to more magical kind of experience. Um, and finally, the last, last uh, point along this line is that um, you need to understand the camera limitations. Um, this uh, type of camera, it's a little less accurate, um, very bright areas. So if you have a really bright window nearby or clear glass or black surfaces will not be picked up very well. Um, there's hole filling implemented in the SDK to sort of help with some of these situations. Um, and there's also um, data so you can tell if you know, the quality of the depth at a given pixel. Um, so giving that feedback to users to let them know whether what they're scanning is going to be useful or not and let them know like immediately so that they don't have to waste time is, is really important. Um, likewise, um, failing gracefully in scenarios where you know there may be too many difficult scenes in the environment. And this is where inactive kind of camera interactions can come into play where um, even though this is an augmented reality kind of thing, building on your real environment, um, you don't want to get into a, you don't want to have people blocked from playing the game because you know, they don't have the right types of blocks available. So fallback situations, especially in this inactive mode, are really important to really make these games effective. So we have a um, first version of a UX design guidelines document up on the web in the developer zone. Um, we're adding more content and um, obviously welcome any feedback and look to work with developers to get uh, get your feedback on this, this material. Um, so I'll hand it off now to Megana to talk about um, developer aspects. Thanks, Gary. So we so far saw what some of the general UX guidelines are for developing augmented reality applications. So if we were to use the Intel RealSense SDK, what are the things that are available to you in terms of development capabilities for you to start developing applications like the ones that we showed to you till now? So what exactly is scene perception? So scene perception as we define it is at the intersection of a couple of things. You are able to add, you're able to get a sense of your physical world and you are adding virtual content onto it, which is what creates the augmented reality experience, right? That is one. 
The second is how you are able to handle occlusion. So when we talk about occlusion, in this context, what it actually means is if I were to have two objects, one actually covering another object partially, um, will I get a sense of that in 3D space? What are the th kind of things that I'm able to do? So if we were to put this in perspective with the example that we saw, let us go back to the Toysi sample that we saw, right? We had a scene which was more of an office space and augmented to it was a helicopter, we had a car and we had a ramp, which were not there actually in the physical scene. Those were augmented as virtual content onto your application to give that sense of augmented reality. So we have table edges because the whole setup was on a tabletop environment and we are racing the car on top of that space. What happens if I move the car to the point that it is at the edge of the table? The application should ideally be able to detect that and it should fall off the table, right? If, it's, if I'm at this edge, it shouldn't still keep going on thin air. How, how is that handled? The SDK, the Intel RealSense SDK, provides with capabilities to use the object geometry that you have in your real-time environment and use that for computations like the ones that you saw in, um, in, in the example. Another example that I can give to you for augmented reality applications is, say for example, you are trying to teach little kids about different animals. Instead of just showing them a toy, we could make an application that is a lot more interactive. And when you bring that toy in the view or the field of view of the camera, we could bring about an interactive component in the application which would probably say a story or something about dinosaurs. Say for example, what type of dinosaur it is, how many years ago did um, such a dinosaur exist on, on this planet. Something like that which, which makes it more compelling as an experience and it's more engaging than just to have a virtual object and have to teach something using that, right? So, so occlusion, is all, occlusion is one concept that you can use as an application in such applications. It's, it's, it's more, if, if I have one object that is hiding another object, I should be able to sense that in my, in my environment and be able to react to that. Another component of scene perception is also how you do metric measurements. So this is a 3D camera that we are talking about. It's not just 2D. So if we have a depth component in it and I'm capturing a 3D space, if I'm capturing my environment around me, and if I want to measure the distance between any two points, is that x, y, x, y between two different points? No, it's not. It has to essentially take into consideration depth. So that is another capability that you have available within the scene perception module. So we have the Intel RealSense SDK for the rear facing camera. The R200, uh, hold on, just give me one second. So the camera that you see here is the peripheral camera that Kevin showed to you, right? So this has depth capability in it. So for the SDK, there are two different components. One is a front-facing camera, which will actually be embedded into the bezel of devices like the laptop or all-in-one form factors, which is a shorter range and the camera is actually looking at the user sitting in front of the camera. But this is looking at you. It's world facing. It's capturing the world around me. And this has a longer range and it's able to detect from about 0.5 meters to up to about 3.5 meters. So the Intel RealSense SDK allows you to use both of these cameras and build augmented reality applications. For the vast majority of the content that we will talk about today, we will focus on the rear facing camera. But at the end of the presentation, I will also walk you through some of the usages that you could build using the user facing camera as well. So the, the library that allows you to do all of these computations is the libpxc scene perception. 
The SDK is available free for download on the Intel Developer Zone. The resources page at the end of the presentation will actually provide you a link from where you can download it. So we will uh, now walk you through some of the sample applications to give you a sense of what those three things that we showed were, right? One is you are able to capture depth using the camera and create a 3D dense model using the, the depth data. Uh, the second is how you can actually augment a virtual object onto a physical space. And the third is how you can do measurements using two different points with depth. So let's get to the demo using the RealSense SDK. All of these samples that I will show to you today are all in the SDK. So if you were to download it after um, the talk today, you will be able to access all of these samples. It's pretty simplistic. Okay. Let me know if you can see what I'm, are you able to see? Is it projecting what I can see on the screen? Okay, so this is the augmented reality sample. So as you can see, it is a world facing camera and it is, it is able to capture all of you. The range of the camera is right now limited to about 3.5 meters and also there are certain depth limitations to the camera and how it performs the functions using scene perception. It is important for me to have an adequate amount of geometry to be able to use the library, which is kind of necessary for the samples that we talked about, right? If I, have, if I want a car to fall off the edge of the table, I need to, need to be able to detect that. So if I point at this camera at the carpet, it will probably not work very effectively. So let me, we, we kind of had to go ahead and do this helter-skelter setup right before the presentation so that we are able to demonstrate it. So initially up till this point, you were seeing in red that the camera was not really able to track effectively, right? But now, since there is, I'm pointing the camera at a space, say this is my cubicle space, the environment right now is, is, is the volume is kind of about two meter, um, meter cube. So if I am pointing to something on the table which has a lot of objects on it, the tracking status goes to high accuracy, which indicates that the range in which I'm detecting the camera is good enough, the lighting is good enough, and I have adequate geometry for my library to do what I'm expecting it to do. And now there is a shoot button that gets enabled here. So if I click on that button, there is a ball that is embedded there. So most of you might be getting the sense for, um, most of you might be thinking the ball is actually cut off. The application probably did not draw the ball as well as it should have. Think about it, that's not true. What it is actually doing is it sends the surface of the table and objects on top of it. And when I shot the ball at the table, it actually embed the ball inside the table. So if I now move in real time around the object, you will see that the ball is still stuck there in real time. That is actually demonstrating parts of the occlusion principle that we just now talked about, right? And it is also augmenting your real environment, which is this tabletop, with a virtual object, which is a ball. It's a simplistic experiment, but think about how powerful it could be when you start developing applications with, with such capabilities in the SDK. So this is capability number one. The next capability I want to show is, give me just a second, I'll have to switch between applications here. These are all in source code, so there are only some of them that are at this point available with just a binary, so I would bear with me for just one second. Why? No, not now. <laughs> it works just before the presentation, right? And then when I'm presenting, it has to ask for an update. All right, let's see how this goes. All right, go ahead and build it. Failed, great. Okay. 
Let's try another one. Let's go to the measurement sample and see what it does. Okay, so this application will actually give you the capability to, um, will show you the capability of how you can measure the distance between two points in 3D. Again, I will point it at my time-tested experiment table, right? This is the right amount of distance, and let me see if I can capture the distance between those two water bottles, right? Let me point it. If you can see the, the cross mark, okay. It's kind of hidden and it's not very obvious, but come on. Okay. Let me point it at the first water bottle. You see the yellow dot? And now I will try pointing it at the second water bottle. The distance between those two is approximately about 24 inches. And that is taking into consideration the depth. It is not a simple x, y, x dash, y dash distance. It's not a plain, simple differential. So now if I move around the table, you'll see that the line that I drew between the two water bottles, it remains stuck in real time. So these are some of the capabilities that you could use to develop applications using augmented reality. And there are more such samples in the SDK um, there is a separate sample folder inside which there are samples demarcated very clearly for the front-facing camera and the rear-facing camera. But one thing to keep in mind, though, is this, the scene perception module itself is more of a rear-facing camera capability. So if you were using the front-facing camera for augmented reality applications, there are additional modalities that I will talk about at the, at the end of my, my section. But one thing to keep in mind, scene perception is the one modality or the library that is available within the SDK focused exclusively on the R200. So let's switch back to some of my presentation concepts. Sorry about having to switch back and forth between the two devices. Just stay with me. Just give me one second. Oops, Kevin, I did something. Where have we saved it? Okay, thank you. So the one example that did not work, glad I have it in screenshots. The left image is what you have in your real environment, right? You see a backpack, the right image is the dense model reconstructed image of the real-time object. And if you see the green, red, and the blue lines, that is my position with respect to the entire scene in which I'm actually doing the tracking. So as and how you move, that arrow will move along with you. And when you move around the object, as more and more area of the object that you are scanning becomes available, it starts creating that dense model which you can then use to create your meshes if you are if you are using if you are using any low level computation that you need all of this data for there is a way of obtaining this so we saw these two things so i'll i'll move to the next one um, so this these are some of the requirements for the scene perception modality to work so when we say we are capturing an image in real time for you to be able to use the, the libpxc scene perception library, the scene itself has to be static. It's okay if it is moving slightly, but if it is something like a fast moving car, you're racing cars and you're trying to capture that, that might be harder to do. So a requirement is for you to have a static scene. The, the volume in which it works is essentially around um, it, it's, the total range is up to about 3.5 meters, but the scene perception modality has been proven to work more effectively if it is more like a short cubicle space. Um, say, for example, you are trying to capture 
a very close object or maybe a cubicle space in which I have a desk, I have a couple of chairs, that kind of a thing. So if I were to scan this entire room, I may not be able to get the, the, the right um, quality of what you're looking to do. And also the camera can track along six different degrees of freedom. So what we say by six degrees of freedom is you can go top down, left, right, front and back, and then you have the yaw, pitch, and the roll, right? So those are the six different degrees of freedom along which you can get a sense of the image in real space. So those are some of the, the requirements. So now let's get into some of the specifics of the API itself. Do I have, do I have some more time? Okay. So there are essentially three different steps for you to include scene perception for any type of augmented reality application. The first one is configuring the scene itself. What does that mean? You will have to provide some amount of initial data for your library to start functioning. So there are three ways of doing that. The first one is to give an initial camera pose. When I say a pose, it means position plus the orientation. This is with respect to the same six degrees of freedom that we're talking about, right? So you have a rotational matrix and you have a transformational matrix. I won't get into the specifics of it, but Along those lines, you are providing an initial frame data for your camera to pick up and from that point start tracking the actual image. The meshing threshold, again, if a block actually changes in value beyond a certain maximum or an average, there is a way of setting that. And once the, the camera detects that the blocking, the range has changed beyond a certain set threshold, you can do remeshing. Setting voxel resolution, what does that mean? So voxel is the smallest unit of measurement if you, have to, if you have to capture a volume. So essentially what it comes down to is if I have to get the nitty gritty details of say this small object that is sitting on a tabletop and maybe there, there is some kind of a handicraft that is embedded on it, right? When I'm doing something close range, it is important for me to get a high resolution data of that object for me to be able to see what is on it. The same wouldn't be so true if I was looking at something long range because essentially long range is definitely a little lower in resolution because I don't need the level of detail that I would need if I had to capture a very short range object. So the voxel resolution setting is something that allows you to do that. So these are essentially the three um, optional parameters that you can initially feed to the camera from which point on it will start tracking the next additional frames for you to be able to reconstruct the whole scene. So initially this is just the configuration, right? Now when you start getting into the scene quality itself, so when I, when I showed you the actual demo, you saw that initially it was highlighted in red saying that the tracking accuracy was not adequate enough and you are not within the adequate range, right? Why that was, was because Kevin mentioned there are some limitations to how the camera functions because the rear facing camera, essentially what you're doing is you're using the depth capability of the camera, right? So now if, you, if you're pointing the camera at say the carpet or at the wall, there is no geometry, it is, a monotone, there's really nothing there that the camera can work with, right? So in, in such a case, you have to be able to, from within your application, detect whether the image quality that you are getting from within the camera, the data that you're getting from within the camera is good enough for you to do anything with it. And there are APIs that will allow you to do that. There is a check scene quality API, which will essentially give you a value between a zero and a one. Um, you have to have, the scene quality at least above a 0.5. Other than, otherwise, it really doesn't make sense because the image quality is bad. Um, once you get an adequate scene quality, you can essentially start uh, reconstruction by enabling it and start getting each individual frame. And then for each individual frame, you can capture um, the, the meshing data and all of that low level mathematical stuff that you need to do to be able to develop your application. Um, the last ones, again, tracking data. If you, if you are tracking per frame and say at some point 
in real time when you're moving things around, it is just likely that you will hit a point where the quality is not good, right? At that point, the track, the API will actually clearly tell you that it doesn't have the data that it needs to detect pose. Because what it means by saying detecting pose is it's a differential, right? The image was at position one, it changed to position two. So if you don't have two good frames, it's very difficult for you to capture the frame, capture the pose, which is again position and orientation, right? So if frame one succeeds but frame two fails, then I have to essentially start the localization process again and it will go back in time to match the frame that you are currently capturing with the set of frames that are already in the pipeline to make sure that the frame that you captured right now maps with one of them. And then from that point on, you are again able to get the differential. So what, what point I'm trying to make here is instead of kind of going into the extreme low level code and showing you the main function and each, each specific of it, um, I just thought I'll give you an overview of the kind of capabilities there are. The SDK is already freely available, so you can definitely download them and take a look at the source code. But essentially three steps for you to enable scene perception in your apps. Set your initial data, which is configuring, which is where you're setting the voxel resolution, the initial camera pose and everything, right? Second, you check the scene quality and query for tracking accuracy before you can start obtaining the individual frames. When you know for a fact that your data quality is good enough, at that point, you start obtaining individual frames. If necessary, at some point, your frame data drops to a quality less than optimal, it triggers relocalization automatically. So you can get the frame data and map it with the ones that are in the pipeline to be able to again detect pose and orientation effectively. So those are the basic principles around which all of the three samples that I showed to you today are built upon. So let, let's go to some of the general guidelines. I think I already touched upon um, quite a few of these things already. Um, it, it's, it's using the depth camera. So the limitations of the depth camera are equally applicable for the scene perception module. The observed environment is assumed to be containing visual texture and geometry. So if there are shiny objects or if there are plane surfaces like the, the carpet or a wall, it may not adequately work. And it is important for you to also set the voxel resolution because if you know for a fact that your application is going to be tracking close range objects, you don't want to set the voxel resolution to low resolution, in which case you are actually missing out on the quality of data that you're getting. On the contrary, if you know for a fact that you're trying to capitalize on the complete range of the camera, then set it to a lower resolution because you're trying to get a, a larger field of view and you're okay with compromising a little bit on resolution. So here are some of the front-facing camera usages. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a front-facing camera peripheral with me to show to you today. But essentially what it does is, what it is, is for a device of this form factor, it is a camera just like your webcam, but it is a depth camera that is embedded in the bezel of the camera, so in the bezel of the device. So it's essentially looking at me instead of looking at you. So there, is a, there are certain ways in which you can actually develop augmented reality applications for the front-facing camera as well. Though the lip PXC scene perception is actually for um, the rear-facing, there are some ways. So in the front-facing camera, um, okay, before I, before I go to that train of thought, let me reiterate one point with the rear-facing camera. The rear-facing camera form factor is for the the tablets and smaller form factors than that, right? Where you are essentially holding the device with both of your hands. So there's very little that you can do with your hands in that specific scenario. But in a front facing case, you're sitting in front of a laptop, you have your hands at your disposal. You can use that for some of the applications. So for augmented reality, here is one example. The augmented reality, um, the capability of the SDK for front facing cameras has hand tracking and face tracking. Face tracking is available for R202. So if you are using hand tracking module, you're getting contour data, you're getting hand data, you're getting 22 different joint points for each hand and extremity points and even how open the hands, the fingers are, how open the hand is. 
So say for example, I want to get a manicure and I am not very sure about what kind of a nail paint I have to use. My hand is my reality. I'm superimposing that with color to see what will look good. It is augmented reality. It might, lo it might look very simple, but it is, right? That is one usage. If you are using face tracking, again the same thing. Maybe I want to test some makeup on myself and I don't know what will look good on me. I am using my face as the real world and then I am probably trying to superimpose with a color of lipstick. That is augmented reality too. So here are some of the, some of the scenarios in which you could essentially use um, both the front facing camera and the rear facing camera for augmented reality usages. Um, uh, we, we did not deliberately get into the specifics of the code, but we hope that this has given you adequate information to get started for developing augmented reality applications with the Intel RealSense 3D camera and the SDK. Uh, here are some of the resources that are available. The UX guidelines, again, is the same document that uh, Kevin was pointing you to. It has a lot more guidelines than just what we showed to you today because the whole SDK doesn't have only augmented reality. It has a lot more. It also has capabilities for hand tracking, face tracking, 3D scanning. So what are the kind of UX capabilities that you need to be aware of to develop applications for all of those modalities? So all of that is in the UX design guidelines. Uh, we have both our email addresses listed here. If you have any questions, um, if you want to know more, uh, please also visit the Intel Developer Zone. It's software.intel.com. You'll have a lot more information, code samples, articles to help you get started developing applications using RealSense. So that's all we have today. And uh, do we have time for questions? Okay. Hey, thanks a lot for the snapshot of the capabilities. Um, two related questions, whatever you can share. Will there be any support for your uh, RealSense driver in the Sprout? And then more importantly, do you all identify and have any roadmap for form factor that will be similar to that, where we may be in the be able to build educational or map or industry type apps, kind of replacing the overhead projector? Okay, so as we mentioned, the current um, form factor capability that we are looking at, especially con taking into consideration the two different types of cameras that we have, Right, the front facing camera is for the larger form factors, the all-in-one laptops and ultrabook form factors, even two-in-ones, some of them. But the rear facing camera, they are essentially very different usages. So the rear facing camera is usually for the smaller form factors. The ones that we have right now is for the tablets, but it will also extend into phones into the near future. I think also, um, I don't know if I'm on, but um, yeah. So the HP Sprout in particular um, is, it's kind of a different form factor that HP designed using the same F200 camera effectively, but um, I think I would uh, recommend that you check with somebody in the booth who will know the definitive answer of whether um, developing apps with the SDK, how that works with that one, because it's pointing basically in a different way. But I think some of the basic, the raw data you can definitely get to. But um, obviously, like face tracking doesn't matter, doesn't mean the same thing if the camera's pointing down, and so on. Yeah. So I was just curious if y you mentioned that um, the the, the rear-facing camera has pretty good uh, like skeletal detection for the hand. Um, Is this better than like what you could get from a Kinect, let's say? Well, the rear-facing camera actually has. I would say the front facing camera has a lot more capabilities for hand tracking detection okay. up well, to camera, 22 data points. Okay. Um, so you essentially can track four different hands, two hands, it could be two left hands, two right hands at the same time too, and you get 22 different join points okay. for each hand. Um, it's, it's a different usage than Kinect because the range is a shorter range camera, okay. right, for the front facing, whereas the Kinect is uh, for a living room kind yeah. of an experience. So it would it be better, is there like a gesture, li like a facial gesture yeah. library available? Yes, like so you, if you go into the SDK, you will be able to see that for the facial tracking, you have 78 different landmark points that you get for each face in the field of view, and you are also able to get about six built-in emotions but you could also probably detect more using the, the landmark capability itself. Is that a plan? Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, in the beginning, you were talking, um, they were showing the creating virtual uh, landscapes for like games and stuff. Mm -hmm. How big of an area can you capture, and is it possible to stitch multiple landscapes together to create a larger terrain? Um, yeah, I think um, so. The, the the scale we're looking at to get the best balance of resolution is about a meter square, um, as far as like actively scanning at one time. But um, there's no limitation um, in like extending that you know within the game uh, itself. So typically, um, there's there's plugins for Unity and Unreal um, to, to do this. And within the game engine, you can basically add more geometry. So you can scan a little bit more and have that stuck onto another thing. So um, that's one aspect. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. Like there's adding each real chunk to a virtual space to create a huge virtual space. Um, the scene perception is also extensible. So you, it will you know, build onto the environment as far as you keep going. So there's no limit in that respect, uh, it's just a question of the, the voxel resolution. So I think that, um, yeah, it's technically possible. Sorry I missed the uh, first part of the talk. Uh, is there any plan to support non-window OS and also plan to support open OpenNI kind of drivers? So um, currently, the SDK that we have available is targeted for Windows 8 and Windows 10. But we may have support coming up for more operating systems in the future. So um, well, more, fo more huh? yeah, so we are currently looking at, in the near time, Android. But Linux may be in the future. We don't have enough visibility into that. Not now, right now, the SDK that we have again is for Windows only, but the immediate near one may be Android. <laughs> 